On behalf of Butlin International Court and Dispute Resolution Center, I welcome you to today's webinar on the official launch of the QIC DRC mediation service, a topic of significant importance, particularly during a pandemic which has had a considerable impact on business in Qatar and abroad. My name is Hamid Al Misfar and I am the legal and research associate here. I'd like to introduce Mr. Faisal Al Sahuti, the CEO and member of the Judiciary Advi Advisory Board of QIC DRC. Mr. Al Sahuti oversees the administration of the court, the regulatory tribunal, and the Alternative Dispute Resolution Center. Mr. Al Sahuti is an accredited mediator at the Center for Effective Dispute Resolution and will now be giving a welcome note and short introduction to our mediation services. Thank you very much, Hamad. On behalf of Qatar International Court, I would like uh, uh, to say uh, thank you very much to, to join us uh, today and to attend the launch of uh, Qatar International uh, uh, Court Mediation Services, a momentous initiative that marks a new stage in the development of Qatar's judicial system. Qatar International Court has now served for more than 10 years to deliver fair and efficient justice in civil and commercial matters in Qatar. We continually enforce the highest international legal standards. The launch of the mediation service is set to extend the court services to offer greater flexibility, speed, and uh, convenience for businesses operating here in Qatar. The service complements our existing services with a new mediation mechanism to support the growth of Qatar's commercial and financial ecosystem. Parties that choose our services can benefit from the center's case-specific approach and high level of flexibility. The launch of the service coincides with, the, with Qatar's recent ratification of the Singapore uh, uh, Convention on Mediation. The convention is a uniform and efficient framework for international settlement agreement resulting from mediation. It will definitely help facilitate international trade and commerce by enabling disputing parties to easily enforce and invoke settlement agreement across borders. And the, the state of Qatar is proud to be a signatory uh, to it. Today, businesses and investors in Qatar rely on a secure and flexible legal system and the mediation service offered by the court will meet these uh, requirements. We proudly continue to expand uh, uh, our services to foster successful commerce and investment as part of the economic development pillar set out uh, in Qatar National Region 2030. And thank you very much again. Thank you, Mr. Faisal. Mediation is rising in different areas of commercial law, including those where mediation was not traditionally employed as a dispute settlement mechanism. The QIC DRC is proud to launch Qatar's first administrative mediation service and continue expanding the rule of law in Qatar. Today, we welcome four esteemed panelists to discuss the newly launched mediation services, the history of mediation in Qatar, the single convention on mediation, and the impact of COVID-19 on mediation. I will now be introducing our four panelists for today's discussion. Our very own Justice Francis Kirkham, an accomplished judge in England and in Qatar, she has practiced as a solicitor in England until her appointment as one of the English Technology and Construction Court judges, a post she held until 2011. 
Frances is a justice of the Qatar International Court and Dispute Resolution Center. She also works as a mediator and arbitrator for both domestic and international disputes and as an adjudicator. Sultan Al Abdullah has been in private practice for over 20 years. His practice focuses on handling major regulatory matters and complex disputes. As a litigator, he represents clients before all tiers of courts in Qatar up to the Court of Cassation. As part of his arbitration practice, he represented numerous entities in local and international arbitration matters and frequently sits as an arbitrator. In addition, he is frequently called to appear as a Qatari law expert before international arbitral tribunals. He is also designated as an arbitrator on the EXCEED panel of arbitrators. Thirdly, George Lee. Turning to our third panelist, he is a senior counsel and the president and was the president of the Law Society of Singapore between 1998 till 1999 and currently chairs the Singapore International Mediation Center. George serves on the board of the International Mediation Institute and was Singapore's mediation consultant to UNCITRU, which led to the adoption of the Singapore Convention on Mediation. He is the co-editor of Mediation in Singapore, a practical guide. And finally, Zachary Kahlo is a professor of law at Hamad bin Khalifa University. He is also professor of law at the University of Notre Dame, Australia, and visiting professor of law and business at the Open University. He was an associate attorney with Buckley LLP in Washington, DC, is a member of the Qatar Sports Arbitration Tribunal, and serves on the ethics committee of the International Mediation Institute. He is co-editor and most recently of Agay P. Justice and Law. Let's begin by discussing the launch of mediation services at the QIC DRC and the overall benefits of mediation in contrast to arbitration and legal proceedings. Your Honor, Judge Kirkham, could you provide us some further insight into mediation and its rules? <clears throat> Um, Hamad, thank you, and thank you for that uh, very generous and kind introduction. So just to set the scene for today's um, seminar, um, if you're unfortunate enough to have a dispute with someone, there's ways in which you can try to resolve it. Um, you might sit down and have a discussion and negotiate and come to an answer. Um, and if you're able to do that, that's all well and good. If you can't, then for uh, many people, the only answer is to take your dispute to a court or to arbitration. But there are, of course, limitations on what judges and arbitrators can actually do. Um, they can decide which party has a good case and which party has a bad case. Um, in other words, they can say, well, A is right and B is wrong. So you end up with a winner and a loser. Courts and arbitrators will usually be able to decide how much compensation might be paid by a party. But that is all. That's as far as they can go. Judges and arbitrators are not in a position to help people to deal with many of the issues which are in relation to a dispute. And very often, those are the underlying issues. And judgments from courts and arbitrators leave parties polarized. And above all, when you take your case to a court or to arbitration for it to be decided by a third person, you lose control of that, of, of the whole process. A mediation is a completely different process. The mediator's role is not to tell, which, tell the parties which one is right and which one is wrong. That's not to say that mediators won't, um, in discussion with parties, engage in some reality testing, which might be quite tough, helping parties to look at their case more objectively than perhaps they have hitherto, and helping them maybe to see the case from um, the other party's um, point of view. But where mediators are really able to help is in helping the parties themselves to decide what a sensible outcome um, might be and helping them to look well beyond 
issues um, which are actually um, in their foremost in their minds when dealing with a court or an arbitration case. So it's a process which enables parties to decide for themselves the basis on which they're willing to resolve um, their disputes. In other words, the parties keep control of that resolution uh, process. And one of the other huge benefits of mediation is that um, it can be conducted at an early stage. Of course, the longer that people um, continue with court proceedings or arbitral proceedings, the more money they spend. It's a very expensive process very often. And the more it distracts them from their everyday lives and the everyday business that they're trying to run and deal with. Um, it can be a major distraction and it can have huge um, disadvantageous um, impacts on your business and on your, your personal um, life. Now, a good mediator can help parties to agree a settlement, um, achieve um, a sensible resolution of a dispute that the parties are willing to live with, um, and a huge saving in cost um, by dealing with the matter um, at an early stage. And that leaves everybody to get on with their lives and do the more important things in life. I'm absolutely delighted that the Qatar International Court is offering a mediation service. And all the details are on the website and they're um, very clear um, and I hope um, readily understandable. It seems to me that it's very important that an international court of this sort should offer a full dispute resolution service, um, and that plainly includes offering mediation uh, as a service. The Qatar International Court is able to nominate first class mediators from around the world um, who can provide the right level of skill and experience to help parties to resolve their disputes. It's been a great pleasure to take part um, in this formal launch of a service, which will, I hope, I'm sure, um, be of huge benefit um, to users. So, Hamad, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Judge Francis. Qatar has a long history in the peaceful sentiment, settlement of disputes. Mr. Sultan and Abdullah, could you elaborate on the history of mediation in the local culture and the advantages of mediation over litigation and arbitration? Um, Mr. Sultan, could you just uh, unmute your microphone for us? With apologies, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, all, and, and thank you again, Hamid, for uh, the introduction. Many thanks for the um, court, Qatar International Court, for organizing this webinar. Uh, I am uh, indeed pleased and honored to participate in this launch and this webinar um, alongside such a distinguished uh, panel. Um, uh, at the dawn of the third millennium, uh, many writings uh, appeared in this part of the world uh, predicting the fast spread of two important uh, alternative dispute resolution uh, practices, uh, 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 namely arbitration and uh, mediation. Uh, and those expectations and prophecies came true in regards to arbitration, which has gained uh, many followers, uh, if I may call them that, and a large number of specialists uh, residing in, in the area. Um, however, and just as much, the expectations regarding the spread of mediation uh, have failed. Uh, so what happened and how can mediation succeed in, in the same way arbitration did? Before uh, attempting to answer these questions, I would like 
first to uh, uh, touch very briefly on the history of mediation in the local culture. So until the 1940s, when oil was discovered, pearl diving was one of Qatar's main industries and uh, many relationships within the society revolved around that industry. Um, and because pearl diving was, a, was, as I said, a major industry within the Arabian Gulf for hundreds of years before that, it was regulated by many unwritten rules, including rules and practices for um, settling disputes um, between or among ship owners, uh, among ship owners and sailors and divers, uh, and among merchants and individuals. Uh, amazingly, the vast majority of these disputes were settled through mediation and mediators who were chosen by parties on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. In Qatar, uh, those mediators were known as Ahl Salfa, loosely translated as people of the say, or uh, the wise people, if you like. Uh, the core competency of Ahl Salfa is the trust and confidence the parties placed in their person. They could be illiterate and usually not independent. Indeed, they could have business or familial relationship with one or both parties. Uh, nonetheless, because of the confidence the parties have in them, they would still be chosen as mediators. So the, the process of mediation is concluded swiftly, where the parties and the mediator meet over coffee, literally. Um, the parties are given the opportunity to state their version of the dispute and their suggestions for what would be an acceptable settlement. The mediator then gives his recommendations and the parties are given the opportunity to comment on them. He then amends his recommendations, as it were, until the parties uh, arrive at a settlement. If no settlement is procured, uh, either party may then take their case to a judge. As primitive as it may now seem, the system really worked. It was most effective in settling thousands of small disputes because parties felt that they could achieve more through mediation than through referring matters to judges. So with the demise of the pearl industry which started in the 1950s, as you know, the mediation system was gradually deserted and tendency shifted towards um, litigation, which became the order of the day. And eventually mediation faded away completely. So by the, third, by the beginning of the third millennium, uh, Qatar was one of the fastest growing economies in the world. Uh, this led to a, a proliferation in the number and complexity of disputes. The judicial system went through considerable developments and consolidation, but soon became overcrowded. This is the reason arbitration uh, uh, gained quick popularity and wide uh, recognition. 
mediation and arbitration belong to the same family known as alternative dispute resolution methods or ADR for short. And they both share common characters such as speed, flexibility and confidentiality. However, arbitration and mediation differ in at least two very important aspects, um, namely cost and enforceability. So unlike in the early days, arbitration has become very expensive and its costs uh, usually exceed, at least in the Arab region, the costs of litigation, even if um, the cases before the judiciary uh, take a few extra years. By contrast, mediation is perceived as a cost efficient uh, method of settling disputes, given the short time it takes. Uh, this is a clear uh, advantage uh, for mediation uh, over arbitration. Uh, however, arbitration scores a major point in relation to enforceability, given that arbitral awards are enforceable in more than 160 jurisdiction around, jurisdictions around the world under the 1958 uh, New York Convention. I think the correct count now is 166 uh, countries uh, since Sierra Leone has acceded to the convention last week on October 28. Uh, by contrast, mediation is not binding and not uh, enforceable. And this is perhaps the loophole that the Singapore Convention on Mediation, which uh, uh, has so far been signed by 53 countries, aims to address. I believe my colleagues on the panel will discuss this point further. Um, there are several distinguishing factors between mediation and arbitration, but I do not propose to go through them because of the limited time available. I will just mention that by resorting to mediation and avoiding conflict before either judicial um, or arbitral tribunals, parties are effectively preserving their working relationship. So unlike litigation or arbitration, the non-confrontational nature of mediation usually preserves the cordial relationship between parties in a manner that um, allows them to cooperate and work together in the future. Um, in uh, Judge Kirkham's words, there, there are no uh, winners and, and losers in, in mediation. Um, but despite its effective features, Spreading the culture of mediation locally requires concentrated efforts at different levels. For example, I believe it is important to codify and regulate mediation in the same manner arbitration has been codified. I also believe that specialized centers such as the QIC, DRC, and Kika in Qatar should provide training programs to qualify mediators in the same manner as arbitrators. And finally, more work has to be done to educate the public about mediation as an alternative mechanism for resolving disputes and explaining the advantages it provides. I will end my presentation here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Sultan. The recent pandemic has changed the world as we know it permanently and has created a new normal, including in the legal sector. Today's webinar provides a small insight into how mediation will be conducted in the future online. Mr. Lim, 
Could you expand on the advantages and disadvantages of the increasing use of hybrid dispute resolution, as well as your recent experiences in online mediation due to COVID-19? Thank you, Hamad. Thank you, Hamad. And uh, is, is, is the screen moving? Hello? Yes. 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 <laughs> okay. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I want to thank um, QICDRC for inviting me to this webinar. It is a great privilege. And, and uh, congratulations, all right, to the center for launching your mediation service. And before I begin, I just want to say I miss your country. <laughs> you know, I'm a frequent flyer of Qatar Airways, <laughs> and, and you have one of the best airports in the world. Uh, if not the best lounge, the best business class lounge. So I hope one day, you know, um, that we can go back to our old normal uh, travel routine. Yes, so I'm, I'm here to share um, just two points, okay? Um, I think the first point uh, is on the increase in use of hybrid dispute resolution processes, meaning arbitration and mediation. And then the second point is, you know, online mediation in, in, in COVID times, okay? So I've just got two slides. So if you just bear with me, uh, I'm going to try and share screen. Okay, the share screen doesn't seem to be working, although it worked just now. Can somebody assist me with the slide? Yes, of course. Um, yeah, we, I'm well, sorry. Yeah. yeah, no worries. Okay, I've got it now. I've got it now. Okay, apologize for that. Um, all right, so this is my first slide, and uh, it's on the increasing use of hybrid processes or right, in dispute resolution. So this is a survey done by the, the Queen Mary University in 2018. And it asked respondents, you know, what was your preferred method of resolving cross-border disputes? Okay. And, and the three main groups are um, private practitioners, which are represented by that blue column, okay, arbitrators, the light gray column, and in-house counsel, okay, the, the, the dark gray or black column. Okay, do you see that? Everyone. Okay, so just look at, just focus on the center three columns. Okay, so when they ask uh, respondents, what was your preferred method of resolving cross-border disputes uh, in relation to international arbitration as a standalone mechanism? Um, the private practitioners, okay, people like me, <laughs> um, said 51 of them, 51% said yes, arbitration, standalone, okay? And then you ask the arbitrators, of course, 54%. But when they ask the in-house counsel, it was 32 percent so you see the difference okay, in views and you move your 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 eyes to the to the left just to the left the three columns on the left and when they asked the respondents okay what was your preferred um, mode of resolving cross-border disputes um international arbitration together with with adr meaning mediation okay arbitration and mediation 46% of the private, private practitioners said 46%. Um, arbitrators, 43%. And then when they asked the in-house counsel, it was 60%. Okay. So just take a moment to, 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 to absorb those numbers. Um, what does this show? Okay. For me, there, there are two learning points here. And, and the first learning point is sometimes we think we know the ground. Those of us who practice as as litigators, arbitrators, as lawyers. We think we know the ground. Um, but for me, the ground is better represented by the in-house counsel. They are the ones who represent the companies, the businesses. And, and, and this survey shows that um, the trend, the, the preference today is for uh, dispute resolution processes to be used in combination, complementary. Okay, and, and to me, actually, this is the trend in the world. Um, 
you will see the evidence of this in terms of arbitration centers now providing mediation services, okay? Just like us, QIC, DRC. Um, and, and this is true of many, many arbitration centers all over the world, okay? Uh, so you see that this reflects the ground. And for me, the point is this, it is not a zero sum game. It's not a zero sum game. It's not arbitration versus mediation, uh, litigation versus mediation. I think we need to see the new world in terms of the different dispute resolution processes and services being used uh, in a complementary manner together. Okay. What, what is best for the client? What's best for the case? What fits uh, the dispute best? And, and you know what? Many young lawyers ask me today, you know, what's the future for lawyers? And I tell them this, actually, you need to see yourself not just as a litigator or an arbitrator or mediator, but I think you need to equip yourselves with different skills, different skill sets. You need to know enough about each um, so that when a client comes to you, you're able to, to offer a suite of services. And depending on what the client needs, all right, offer that. A, a design, a, a dispute re resolution uh, process which helps the client solve his problem or his or her problem quickly, effectively, efficiently. That, for me, the lawyer of the future who has those skills um, will have an advantage. That's the future. So I tell you, young lawyers in Singapore, please equip yourselves. Go and do training courses in arbitration and mediation, and then you find where your, your niche is, where your forte is, and when clients come to you, you are able to tell them, I can help you. And the main goal is to solve the problem. Solve the problem as best as possible for the client. All right, so that's the first point I'd like to make. Um, the second point is this, okay. This, this is a, a photograph of, of um, an online mediation done in Singapore. I chair the Singapore International Mediation Center. And um, this is a hybrid online mediation, okay? This is happening all over the world today, okay? Because of COVID-19, uh, people are resorting to online mediation. So don't worry, I know mediation is a confidential process. This photo was taken with the consent of the parties, and these are actually the lawyers, not the parties, okay? Um, and the, the, the clients, okay, are on, on, on Zoom. Virtual. You see that screen right at the end, uh, they will appear in the course of the mediation. But this was a joint session which we had. Um, and you see me there on the left, right, with a with mask. So we all do it with masks, with, with safe distancing. <laughs> but, and, and you know, this would have been unthinkable last a year ago, right? Uh, we were saying, oh, I'm not going to do online mediation. It's, it's going to be very difficult. Face to face is the way. But I think we all, we all have learned to adapt. And, and it is true, it is uh, a bit more difficult to connect online, but there are also advantages. And I can give you one, for example, it's so much cheaper now and faster to organize an international cross-border dispute, a mediation for, for international dispute. Okay. In the old days, it would take, it cost so much to organize it, people would say, forget it. Let's just go and fight it, fight it out. But today, if you're doing an arbitration or you're doing a, a court matter, it's so easy to, to organize one. And so it's much cheaper. What have you got to lose? Spend a day, spend two days to try in, in a confidential process and all the benefits uh, that Francis and, and Sotan spoke about. So to me, it's actually, this is one of the advantages, okay? And in the old days, or in last year, you want to do a mediation and you want the decision maker to be there, the CEO, he's not going to fly down to Singapore to Qatar to do this, right? Or to Doha. Um, but today you can get him on screen. Maybe you can't get him for the whole day, but you might be able to get two hours of his time. And, and he probably can be his key to helping you resolve, resolve that dispute. So there, there are advantages, and I think we are all learning new skills, new communication skills, and how to use online mediation effectively. That to me is another, another trend in the future. Okay, I, I will just end with, with la, la, last point, which is on COVID-19. Um, and we all are affected badly, right? Um, this is a terrible disease. I just Google, it's like 48 million people have been affected, 1.2 million deaths, okay? It's turned our world upside down, really. Can't imagine the world today a year ago, right? Um, but because of COVID-19, I think we all know that there, there will be more disputes, all right? There, People will lose jobs, people will break contracts. 
But there is a difference, okay? Um, people will not be able to fulfill their obligations, their contractual obligations, um, not because of their fault, but because of the situation. And for me, this is th there's a difference here, okay? Because, I mean, I've been trained as a lawyer. When a client comes to me, I say, fight it. These are our legal rights. Uh, and you're entitled to do that. But I think, I think in the time of, of COVID, I, I want to make an appeal to people all over the world, right? Um, if we have disputes, I think we need to be more understanding and a bit more compassionate because of the situation. You, you can go all the way if you want to, but I think if we as a society decide to try and resolve, and manage our disputes um, with thinking about both parties' concerns, the underlying interests, as, as, as Francis alluded to, I think that this, this world will be a better place. So for me, during this time in particular, mediation is really a good way to resolve it. And people should resolve that. It's, it's, I mean, if you, can't, if you can't resolve it, you still can go to arbitration or litigation. But why not try it first? So my call is, is that people attempt mediation as the first part of the call during this, this difficult time. So, so, so on that note, I will end. Um, and, and thank you very much um, for listening. Thank you so much for that, Mr. George. I thought it was the third country to ratify the Singapore Convention on Mediation after Singapore and Fiji. The convention was developed by the UN Commission on International Trade to ease the enforcement of mediated settlement, settlement agreements in another contracting state. Mr. Callow, could you touch upon the impact of the convention on mediation and the scope of application, please? Good afternoon, and thank you for the for the kind introduction and for the opportunity to be to be part of this event with such a such a distinguished panel. It's also nice to see, <clears throat> excuse me, to see so many friends in attendance, many of whom I haven't seen for the for the better part of a year. But uh, although we haven't been together, it's nice to be together virtually for uh, at least for a little while. So uh, let let me offer some thoughts on the <clears throat> on the on the Singapore Convention, or as it's more formally known, the UN Convention on the international on international settlement agreements resulting from mediation. And, and I actually want to approach this from, from a couple of perspectives. I think it might be helpful to just briefly describe what the convention does. We've, we've had some, uh, some gestures in this direction, but I'll, I'll add a bit to how the framework that emerges from the convention operates. But then I think it's also quite critical to reflect on what this means for Qatar, both symbolically and, and substantively. Uh, some of the remarks earlier have, have emphasized that one of the limitations or drawbacks to mediation was the question of enforceability and, and the lack of a, a, an easy enforceability regime like you have with arbitration under the 1958 New York Convention. The Singapore Convention aims to do for mediation, for cross-border commercial mediations, what the New York Convention did for arbitration. That is to provide an efficient and effective means for uh, the recognition and enforcement of settlement agreements. Um, the problem has has long been, of course, that in the absence of this kind of framework, uh, a mediated settlement was simply a contract, and parties had to rely on the good faith of the other parties to fulfill their obligations, and in the absence of doing so, would end up essentially back where they began, which was the need to, to litigate a contract. Under the Singapore regime, we'll, we'll have uh, an efficient way of uh, immediately and directly recognizing settlement agreements uh, by member countries. Uh, so as, uh, as Mr. Sultan mentioned, I believe it's now 50, 53 countries have signed and six have ratified. Let me see if I, can, if I can do this. The six that have ratified, Singapore, Fiji, Qatar was the third, um, Ecuador, Saudi Arabia and Belarus. I, I think I've got that right. Uh, but Qatar was the third country to, to ratify in, uh, in the middle of March. And, and under the terms of the convention, it required three countries to ratify before it would come into, into force. So, so Qatar's ratification was what began the 
six month countdown to the entering into force of the convention, which happened in uh, in mid September. Um, I, I think you have a general sense of what the convention does. Obviously, we could say a lot more about it, but what what I think I'd like to spend a few moments talking about is the significance of this for Qatar domestically. I mean, obviously, Qatar has entered into the convention scheme, but right now we have six countries which have ratified. And so it, it still is of relatively limited force. And, and time will tell, right? Time will tell what becomes of the regime that is potentially envisioned from the convention and whether something uh, approximating the New York convention arises or not, uh, we, we will have to, uh, to see. Um, the US and China have both signed, but they haven't ratified. Uh, there, there are some issues in the EU in terms of determining how they will perhaps participate in the, in, in the system. Uh, the UK is distracted. Indeed, much of the world is, is distracted by, by COVID, and I think that's not a, an insignificant part of, of the story. But there's, there's that, the international dimension of what will happen with respect to, to this scheme. But it also seems to me that the fact that Qatar so aggressively embraced this regime is significant in ways that go beyond the architecture of the convention itself. Uh, I, I was in Singapore for the for the signing ceremony, and Qatar was not on the initial list of countries that would be attending. And then at the at, on the very last day, it was announced that um, representatives would come and sign and, and join the convention, and, and then the very quick ratification. What this signals to me is, is a number of things. One, that mediation now has the attention and support of the government at the highest levels. And, and I think this is, this is very uh, significant for the future development of a mediation ecosystem, if you will, within, uh, within the country. Um, and, and I also think this is not, this is not an ephemeral moment. Um, rather, we are entering, I hope, a moment where there is space and opportunity for a sustained discussion about how mediation will fit within the broader framework of dispute resolution within the country as a whole. Um, I believe it was, uh, was Mr. Sultan who mentioned um, arbitration. And, and when I came to the country six years ago, that was what everybody spoke about. The conferences, the, uh, the events, the conversations among the legal community were about arbitration and an anticipation of the promulgation of the new uh, arbitration law in 2017. So all of the oxygen was, was really focused for a period of time on, on arbitration. And it seems to me, and at least I hope, that perhaps we're entering a moment where that same kind of concerted attention can be given to how to develop mediation. And so while uh, the promulgation of uh, the court's new service was not in any way coordinated with the convention, I think the, the confluence of these two events it, it couldn't be more, uh, couldn't be more uh, appropriate and, and opportune because it does reflect the, the, the emergence of a critical mass of attention and, and activity in this area. And, and that's really quite, uh, quite critical. Just if I may, in, in the last uh, minute or two that, that I have by way of conclusion, I, I, I wanna echo a couple of things that have already been said. Uh, th this is the problem with going last on, on a panel filled with, uh, with many wise people is that uh, many of the things you thought you would say have been said already, but I will perhaps amplify and add. And, and that's on this. Um, What's next, right? Qatar has signed the convention, the international scheme will develop as it will, but what needs to happen domestically um, to, to advance mediation, especially for those of us who think this is really an essential component of the development of the legal and, and business ecosystem in the country. Uh, I would echo the need to develop a culture of mediation. Um, I think it's gaining traction, right? You're, you're hearing much more discussion of mediation, more utilization of mediation, but, but it is slow. And, and I think we need to develop um, a culture here where mediation is thought of, where it is embraced, where it is utilized in, in contracts, and to think seriously about why that hasn't happened up, up to this point. Um, I think there are many interesting hypotheses as to why Qatar has perhaps been slow to embrace mediation. Um, the historical dimension is actually fascinating. I, I really appreciated hearing the the story of mediation in, in the history of um, pearl diving. And we, we had a discussion in my class, uh, my legal ethics class last week, I think perhaps some of my uh, uh, um, 
uh, wonderful students are with us today, but we, we spoke about how paradoxically the, the, the deeply rooted role of mediation in, in Arab and Islamic cultures may in fact be an impediment to its embrace in more formalized ways within kind of, kind of modern institutional and business forms. And there's some interesting questions that, that can be explored there. You know, the fact that Qatar is a civil law system and mediation for, for complicated uh, cultural and, and, and um, um, sort of principled reasons has, has better taken root in, in common law countries. And it's perhaps uh, not surprising that uh, these rules are being announced by a court that is, is embedded in a, in a common law um, culture. Um, and, and we also have the predominant role, I think, of, of, of the government, of, of state and state, quasi-state entities in contracting here, which perhaps has, has changed some of the incentive structure that arises around mediation. But, but I do think we need to think systematically about um, how we got to where we are and how we get to where we would like to, uh, to go. Um, and then one other point, uh, I believe also that, um, uh, that Mr. Sultan mentioned, which was about, um, about laws. I think we need to have a conversation about what sorts of legal um, forms need to be put in place. There's the immediate question of whether implementing legislation related to the convention um, is necessary. But, but more generally, I think a conversation needs to be had about how mediation will be treated in law in Qatar. There are, I believe, only three countries in the region that currently have statutes that deal specifically with mediation, Qatar does not. But there are all sorts of questions, such as um, uh, establishing a system for the recognition of settlements, establishing grounds for refusing enforcement, whether a system for regulating or licensing mediators is something that is desirable, what role uh, mediation might play within domestic courts. So a whole host of questions that emerge out of and are related to, but in some sense go beyond um, Singapore. So just by way of closing, uh, something that was often talked about at, at the signing convention was how the, the aspirations of this movement were not only to create this, this international regime, but also to encourage mediation, this kind of softer objective of making mediation attractive and encouraging states to, to begin to utilize it. And I think in that respect, we see what is happening in Qatar not simply through its ratification of the convention, but things like the, the uh, promulgation of these rules and the broader conversation that is happening as, as a, a, a real case study in how uh, the global landscape is changing and, uh, and can change. And in that respect, I, uh, I have a lot of optimism for, for where we'll be going in the, uh, in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Zachary. Thank you, panelists, for discussing the launch of the mediation services at QIC-DRC. We will now be holding a Q&A session for our audience members to answer any questions you might have regarding mediation and the QIC-DRC mediation services. One of the questions I have here is, are there any types of disputes which are inherently unsuitable for mediation? Which one of our panelists would like to answer that question? Shall I? Perhaps maybe, yes, Mr. George, please go. I'd I like to turn the question the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, to me, every, every dispute can be settled if the parties are willing. Okay. But I, I realize, I, I, I mean, the, the reality is that there are some cases um, which, which may, where, where mediation may not be the best suitable form. For example, where you need a legal precedent, okay? Um, or where there, there are certain um, rights, which or principles, which uh, parties will want to uh, pursue, um, and, and they, they prefer to have uh, a ruling on, on that. But having said that, I mean, I mean, from experience, uh, almost any case, almost every case can, can be mediated, assuming the parties are willing to try it. That, that is my experience. And, and maybe the other panelists can, can share as well. Thank you. 
Thank you for that, Mr. George. I have a question here addressed to Mr. Zachary. Um, would you please talk more about the culture of mediation and legal culture of mediation that could be developed here in Qatar and perhaps in the region or abroad? Sure. Um, I, what I had in mind was the idea that um, the use of mediation isn't simply about the existence of laws or institutions, but but it is about a, a certain. I, I I think there's a dialectical quality to this that that the existence of laws, of institutions. Institutions that do the sorts of things we talked about that that train mediators that accredit mediators. The existence of practices within institutions like courts emerge and reflect and in turn shape and reshape. Expectations of people of parties of the business community. And, and it seems to me that that those 2 dynamics are going to have to emerge side by side. In the sense that Cutler has a long ways to go in developing the full range of laws. And of institutions to fully support a vibrant um, legal culture and business culture of mediation. But at the same time, I think that will emerge in part through the further development of what we're starting to see, which is an openness to mediation amongst the prospective stakeholders. You know, the sorts of subtle things that, that I spoke about that people are now talking about mediation in a way that you simply didn't see five or six years ago. That it's beginning to, uh, I mean, some, some of the, some of the folks in attendance will, will, you know, who, who, who are in practice will know some of the particulars more than I do, but, but you hear stories about mediation being more fully used in, in certain kinds of contractual situations. And so I think these 2 things go, go back and forth, but, you know, mediation, sort of the modern mediation movement, as we, as we think about it, and in which the courts and the courts rules are participating really, uh, I mean, it came of age. In, in the United States in the 1970s. I mean, I think that's where I would locate the, the genesis of much of, of what we're now working within. And so it's quite new. And, and the slow pace at which Qatar has kind of embraced a culture of mediation broadly defined is far from, um, is far from unique. In, in, indeed, um, I think more countries than not have, have exhibited a certain kind of hesitancy or skepticism towards uh, incorporating mediation more fully into the into the architecture of dispute resolution regimes. I think, though, as, as, as I mentioned at the end of my remarks, that that the reasons for that are going to some extent be unique to each particular context or, or region. And part of what I think we can helpfully do in Qatar and with the court and other stakeholders is to continue to have these conversations that not only promote the idea and the utility of mediation for all the reasons that my colleagues have have mentioned, but to also probe ways within which mediation can exist and thrive in this particular ecosystem, given all the particular dynamics. And Qatar is very unique in lots of ways, right? The role of the state in contracting, the, the fact that you have a, a domestic legal system that is civil law, an international court. That is common law. I mean, there are all kinds of you know, the fact that the legal community is is so profoundly transnational with lawyers coming from all sorts of different systems and able to practice under the authority of their own uh, their own license. Um, so you don't have here a kind of unified legal culture that that would that would um, provide a locus for for this conversation. But I think that's something that we need to uh, to 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 engage further. And this is such a prime moment for doing so in light of uh, in light of the convention in in light of the new mediation service and and so forth so that that broadly is what uh, what i meant by kind of advancing a a culture of mediation thank you for that mr zachary uh judge francis i have a two part question for you um do you think it is better to have regulations for mediation and are the mediators selected by the parties or it is like experts opinion? Thank you very much, Hamad. Yes, I'll try and deal with that um, briefly. Um, I think the question of regulation for mediation is 
is a very wide one and one um, which needs more than a couple of minutes for a, um, a, a useful answer. Um, from my perspective, I see um, the current um, approach to mediation, which we generally see across the world, um, as being useful in that it's entirely flexible. Um, a skilled mediator is able to um, approach a mediation um, in a way which he or she thinks is best going to help the parties in relation to the dispute which they actually have. Um, and so from that point of view, I would be reluctant to um, see um, regulation which might um, become uh, over rigid. I think that there is there is a risk of that. Um, and um, as to the second part of the question, sorry, just remind me. The second uh, part of the question is, is a mediator selected by the parties or is it similar to appointing an expert's opinion? Oh, thank you. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, well, under the um, under the scheme which um, the Qatar International Court um, is offering, um, if the parties wish, um, they can apply to the court um, and the registry will um, nominate um, a, a mediator. Um, and so I, th I hope that that will provide um, a really useful service to parties who maybe are unable to agree on a mediator or maybe who um, don't know who might best be able to help them. So I, I hope that that's going to be a really helpful part of the um, the service that the court is offering. Thank you so much for that, Judge uh, Francis. In closing, our panelists have clearly established the numerous advantages of mediation, including time and cost efficiency, confidentiality, and its non-confrontational character. Let's wrap up today. I want to extend a special thank you to our distinguished panelists for offering these fascinating first-hand instance insights and furthering the discussion. I also want to thank our audience members for attending the launch of QICDRC's mediation services. We are hopeful that today's takeaways on the advantages, history, and future of mediation will be beneficial to you all. Thank you, panelists. Thank you for everyone. Thank you, Hamid. Thanks.